Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. We continue our series of keys to living the obedient Christian life. Keys to living the obedient Christian life. We've already seen three of these keys. The first key was to admit and realize your total inability to live the obedient Christian life in your own strength. There is no way that you and I, in our own strength, can live the obedient Christian life. Not only is it hard, it is impossible. So you need to realize that first. Secondly, once you admit you cannot do it, then we need to look to God for the answer. And God's answer is the Holy Spirit. If you want to put His Reduce his answer to the irreducible minimum. It is the Holy Spirit. If you understand that and appropriate the person of the Holy Spirit in your life, then you will be able to live the obedient Christian life. In fact, in chapter 8 of Romans, Paul talks about the Holy Spirit and his role in the Christian's obedient life. Before chapter 8, in the first seven chapters of Romans, the Holy Spirit is mentioned one time. In chapter 5, verse 5. But in chapter 8 alone, the Holy Spirit is mentioned 17 times. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out. Paul wants us to realize the key, the absolute key, to unlock the obedient Christian life is the person of the Holy Spirit who is the third person of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the first thing we need to realize is that the Holy Spirit has given us a no condemnation status. We have been pardoned. Not paroled, but pardoned. The guilty sentence has been removed from us. And it was the Holy Spirit that applied this reality to us. You can understand it this way. When you look at the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what we notice is that God the Father came up with the plan of redemption. He came up with the plan of electing those that He would save. The Son came to accomplish the work of redemption. Jesus came and lived that perfect life that we could not live, earning eternal life, died on the cross, took our place, bore our sins, was resurrected from the dead, and has ascended into heaven. So he accomplished the redemptive plan of the Father. And now it is God the Holy Spirit that applies the redemptive plan that was accomplished by the Lord Jesus and planned by the Father. You see, it is the Holy Spirit that causes us to be born again. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers us and enables us to live the Christian life. And so that's why Paul gives us in chapter 8 this glorious truth about the Holy Spirit. He is called in Hebrews the executor of our new covenant. The executor of a Will is the one who is responsible for seeing that the will is executed, that it is carried forth. The Holy Spirit is the executor of the new covenant, the new will. He is the one that sees to it that it is carried forth in our lives. And so we look at the fourth truth today, and that is that we must live according to your new self. Because the Holy Spirit has brought about 
a miraculous work in the life of a believer and has created a new self. Now this new self is called different things in Scripture, but they're all synonymous terms. And I want to just look at a few of the terms used so when you read them other places, you won't be confused. Paul speaks of the new self in 2 Corinthians 5 as new creation. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, you remember we saw last week that that phrase in Christ means joined to Christ, in union with Christ, in other words, someone who is a Christian. If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, new things have come. Now, when you became a Christian, you became a new creation. Now, obviously, he's not talking about outwardly because you don't look any different other than you've aged a little bit, maybe gained a few pounds, maybe lost a little hair than you did when you became a Christian. Now, I became a Christian at six, so I look a lot different. But at the moment I became a Christian, I became a new creation, but I didn't look any different. So he's talking about something going on inwardly, within us. That new creation is that new self. Scripture sometimes calls it the new man. But notice, it comes about when we are in Christ. It comes about at our regeneration. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul refers to it as the inner man. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, that's his flesh, getting older, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Now he's talking about the new self. So here we see something else about this new self. Not only does it come about when we are born again, but it also grows, it matures, it is renewed day by day. This body wears down, the inner man just gets stronger because it's going to live throughout eternity. Also in Colossians chapter 3, we see that it is referred to by Paul as the new self. He says, Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. That's the part of you, that's the old sin nature. That's the part of you before you were Christian that dominated your life. He says, Lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Now this tells us something else about this new man, this inner self, this new self. It's created in the image of God in righteousness and in truth. Hallelujah. The old man was created in the image of sin. It was corrupted. The new self is created in the image of Christ. It's righteous. And then over in Ephesians 4, Paul again says, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. I read that one earlier, didn't I? All right, now we're in Colossians 3. All right, Colossians 3. Do not lie to one another since you've laid aside the old self with its evil practices. You put on the new self who's being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. This new man, this new self, is to be continually renewed and transformed into the image of Jesus. Yes, Christ. Amen. That's what Christian maturity is all about. It's this new self being conformed to the image of Jesus. Now Paul, in 
the verses of our text today, beginning in verse 5 of Romans 8, he's going to describe for us the differences between the old self and the new self. It's crucial that we understand the differences between the old self, the one dominated by sin, and the new self that is dominated by the Spirit of God. So that you and I can tell which one's having the influence in our life. Because that old self is still hanging around. Now, its power over you has been broken. But it's still hanging around. And it still wants to influence your life. So we're going to look at the differences today. And as we read our passage, see how many you can pick up. Stand in respect for the Word of God as I begin reading in chapter 8, verse 5. For those who according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You may be seated. We're going to see two main differences today between the old self and the new self. First, the difference of commitment. And then secondly, the difference of conditions between the old self and the new self. First, the difference of commitment. The old self is committed to the things of the flesh. Verse 5, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. The old self is, commi is committed to the things of the flesh. It sets its mind on the things of the flesh. Now, to set their mind means their goals, their desires, their main interest, their constant talk, their glory pertains to the things of this world and the sinful human nature. And so Paul is talking about a person before they become a Christian as the one who is committed to the flesh, the old self. You see, their existence is one apart from God. They act according to worldly principles. The big I is their life. They are egocentric. They see everything according to their own life. God does not figure into the equation. Now, they may acknowledge God exists, but He does not figure into their lives. These are the ones who say, just keep your religion on Sunday. Or I've even had people say to me, well, you know, I go to church, but I don't let that affect my life. Now, can you believe that? I mean, they don't realize what they sound like. You've probably heard them say that too. You know, I don't want to get carried away. I go to church, but I don't let it affect my life. Christianity is your life. But it's the one who is not born again, who is living according to the flesh. It's that old self that sees everything in relation to the world and what the world thinks and, and this lower nature. Now, if you want a good understanding of this 
old self and its ways, all you have to do is look over in Galatians chapter 5, because Paul tells us, beginning in verse 19, he says, the deeds of the flesh are evident. They're easy to see. When you see these things, you know that's the flesh. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I have forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you. Now look at this phrase. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now pay close attention. He says those who practice these fleshly activities will not inherit the kingdom of God. I won't come back to that in a moment, so remember that phrase. The old self is committed to the things of this world, to the deeds of the flesh. Now, look at our society. Isn't this a commentary on our society? Look at, at the movie industry and, and, and look at the movie stars. Look at the pro athletes. It's like you're reading a newspaper article about their lives when you read what Paul says about the evidence of the flesh. So the old self is committed to the flesh and the things of the flesh, to the old sin nature. Now the new self, though, in contrast, is committed to the things of the Spirit, as Paul says in the rest of verse 5. But those who are according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. So the new nature is interested in the things of God. This new nature that we have when we're born again, its goals, its desires, its ambitions, its interests pertain to the things of God's kingdom. The new man's whole direction, his whole orientation is different from that of the old self. The new self lives for the things of the Spirit, for God's glory, for doing God's will acts on biblical principles and sets his mind on the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The new self lives by faith and not by sight. He lives by faith in biblical principles based on God's Word. <clears throat> For instance, somebody who is dominated by the old self looks at the concept of giving a 10% to God as ridiculous. They think, why should I be giving my money to that group? They just a bunch of, they just squandered and they just spend it on themselves. The preacher drives these expensive cars. I mean, I could take that 10% and put it in a 401k or 401b or something else and I could have a nice retirement account. I'm not going to give that 10% to the church. But a new self says, yeah, you know, I could take that 10%. I could invest it in a retirement account. It could, it could make a big difference over 40 years. But I believe God when he says give, and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. I believe God when God says store up treasures in heaven where moth or rust cannot destroy. Sure, I'll put some aside for retirement. But that 10%, I'm going to give that to God because you're motivated by a spiritual mindset believing more in the truth of God's Word than in what these eyes can see. And so the old self is committed to the things of the flesh, the sin nature. The new self is committed to the things of the Spirit. Paul tells us how you can tell the new self has shown up. In Galatians 5, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
self-control against such things there is no law. So the old self, his deeds are evident. The new self, his deeds are evident as well. A difference of commitment. Now look at the difference of conditions that Paul gives us between the old self and the new self. First, the condition of the new self is death. Verse 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death. Now it's important that we understand what the Bible means by death. The Bible speaks of death as separation, not extinction. What do you mean, preacher? When the Bible speaks of physical death, it speaks of the spirit being separated from the body. But the spirit continues to live on. It's not extinct. It has simply separated itself from the body. When we are spiritually dead, we are not extinct, but we are separated from God. That's what it means to be spiritually dead. It means to be separated from God. And the old self, that which is corrupted by sin, is spiritually dead. It is spiritually separated from God. And so Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, he wasn't talking about physical death at that point. They were living physically, but he meant spiritually. And when you are spiritually separated from God in your trespasses and sins. Now, that's why Paul writes that a person who practices the deeds of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. Because why? Because he doesn't have spiritual life. He's dead. That's why Paul could say, those who practice these deeds of the flesh are not going to inherit the kingdom because it shows they are separated from God. They are dead. Second condition, not only dead, but hostile toward God. Verse 7. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. The old man, the old self wants his way, not God's way. In fact, he is at enmity with God. You ever noticed how often unbelievers have open hostility against God and the things of his kingdom? And when you stop to think about it, it really is ridiculous. Example. Prayer before the high school football game. Okay. Now... Those of you who are my age remember when we used to do that. All right, how long did those prayers last? Two minutes? Maybe three at most. Now, get upset because they're saying a prayer before a high school football game? What's the big deal? You don't have to even close your eyes. You don't have to bow your head. You can be looking at your iPhone. Why do you care if a other group of people want to pray? How does it really bother you? We're talking about three minutes. You can get up and go to the bathroom if you want to. Nobody's telling you you cannot. Nobody's telling you you got to bow your head. Nobody's telling you you got to pray. You can think about anything you want to think about. What skin is it off your back? Think about it. It's ridiculous to get all upset and get hostile. I guarantee you the ones that are upset don't even go to ball game. But that just shows you the hostility of the flesh against the things of the Spirit. James over in chapter 4 says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Not only is the old self dead, separated from God, not only is the old self hostile toward God, but the old self is rebellious to the law of God. Verse 7. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to. To do so, the old self will not submit to the authority of God's Word. An unbeliever will not submit to the authority 
of the Word of God in his life. He is his own boss. He will do what he wants to do. The fact is, he is dominated by sin, and he's not even able to obey God, Paul says. He's not even able to do so. He can't even understand the things of God with his fleshly mind. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at what Paul says about the mind of the old self. But a natural man, and that's his way of talking about an unbeliever, but the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Well, why not? Because they're foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them. Because they're spiritually appraised. You ever talk to somebody who's a non-Christian about the things of God and it's just like a glaze came over their eyes? It's just like it went, they didn't catch it at all. And you were thinking, I didn't think it was that hard. I didn't think it was that difficult. They cannot understand the things of God. You ever had a non-Christian say to you, man, I don't know why you read that Bible. It doesn't make a bit of sense to me. <laughs> no, it's not going to make sense to them until that mind becomes regenerate, until that mind is born again. So the old self is in rebellion toward God. And then, lastly, it is unable to please God. Verse 8, And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is an indictment on fallen humanity. None of us in our unbelieving, unregenerate status can please God. I don't care what you do. I don't care how good you try to be. You are unable to please God. The old self cannot please God. You could give everything you have to the poor and it would not please God. You could even give your body to be burned as a sacrifice, but it would not please God. Unregenerate man is unable to please God. Even his best deeds are nothing but filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. Proverbs chapter 15 says this, The sacrifice of the wicked... And sacrifices were commanded by God in the Old Testament. They were considered a good thing. But when the wicked does it, what does it become? An abomination. Abomination to the Lord. And so the truth is, the old self, the unregenerate man, cannot, is unable totally to please God in any way. And this is indeed tragic because we should live to please God. Now Paul is setting forth a very important spiritual principle here. And it is this. That which originates in the flesh cannot please God. That which originates in the flesh, the old sin nature, cannot please God. You say, well, preacher, why is that such an important principle? Well, it's important, first of all, because if you're not a Christian, you've got to understand that you can never earn God's acceptance. Never. But if you are a Christian, it's an important principle because you need to realize that if you do anything that originates in your flesh, it is not going to please God and it is not going to bring spiritual results. Those who sow to the flesh reap corruption. Churches can do things out of fleshly motives. Churches must look at their ministries and make sure that they are not originating in the flesh. Churches are in danger of allowing the end to justify the means. The end is we want to get people in church so we can get them under the preaching of the Word. Since that's the end, we think we can use fleshly means to accomplish that, which is pay people to come to church. Offer door prizes. Offer some award. If they'll come to church, we're going to have a drawing. People do this. Churches are doing this. But what sows to the flesh reaps the flesh. You cannot do something in the flesh and expect God to bless it and honor it. 
He won't do it. We must sow to the Spirit and reap life. So what does Paul tell us about the condition of the old self? He tells us it's dead. He tells us that it's hostile toward God. He tells us that it is rebellious to God's law. He tells us that it is unable to please God. Now let's look at the new self and see what he says about it. First, the new self is life and peace. Verse 6. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Now at life he means spiritual life in its full scope. Communion with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing God intimately. Freedom from the power, the pollution, and the penalty of sin. It is understanding and relishing that no condemnation status that we have. Not only life, but peace. Now, in the Middle East, the term peace doesn't just mean absence from conflict. Now, that's what it typically means in the West. In the Middle East, peace meant well-being. It was a general sense of well-being, not just absence of conflict, but prosperity and well-being. And he says that life in the Spirit, that the new self is characterized by peace, a sense of well-being to be reconciled with God. Not only to have the peace with God, but to have the peace of God. It doesn't mean that there won't be some times of turmoil in the believer's life. There will be. But it means that he will gravitate back to a deep sense of peace and well-being in his life. Paul next says that the new self has the Holy Spirit within him. The Holy Spirit makes his home in the new self. In verse 9, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed... The Spirit of God dwells in you. The word dwells was from the Greek word that means home. So what he's saying is that the Holy Spirit makes his home in the believer, in the new self. He doesn't just come and visit and then go away. He comes to abide. He comes to stay. He comes to make his home. It is His presence that makes our minds seek the things of God. We are the temple of God. He is within us. It is the Holy Spirit who enables and motivates our new self to set our minds on the things of the Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, He says, in fact, you're not even a Christian. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ... He does not belong to Him. You don't get the Holy Spirit sometime after you become a Christian. You get Him at the moment of conversion. It's not a second blessing. He comes at the time. Because if you don't have Him, you're not a believer, a Christian at all, Paul says. You say, well, how can I know if the Holy Spirit indwells me? Well, your life should get evidence of it. You should see His fruit in your life. The fruit we saw a little earlier, love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and self-control. Those things should be showing themselves in your life. They are His fruit and they should be showing an evidence in your life. Next, the new self has eternal life. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin... The Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now follow Paul's thinking. He says, okay, the body is dead because of sin. That old sin nature hangs around in this body, this humanity. Okay? The wages of sin is death. So because of sin, this body is dead. But this new self that's been given the righteousness of Jesus is alive because the cause of death has been removed. The cause of death is sin. Speak in terms of separation. Because the new self has no sin, has been declared righteous, 
no condemnation, pardoned, it is, can be joined to God and therefore is alive. And so the new self has eternal life because it has the righteousness of Christ. We are declared righteous. It is imputed to us. Our spirit is no longer separated from Him, but it is alive. When Christ is in us, His righteousness becomes our righteousness. Therefore, the cause of spiritual death is removed, and we have fellowship and communion with Him. You say, but why does the body still have to die? Because that principle of sin is still hanging around in that body. It has not been eradicated yet. Its power has been broken in our lives, but it has not been annihilated. And we could spend probably an hour or two talking about why God didn't just get rid of it. Well, one reason is because it brings greater glory to Him when you live a righteous life, even though that old sin man wants to pull you down. It brings greater glory to God. It enables you to grow in the spiritual maturity because you resist. It causes you to have to depend on God. Whereas if you were never tempted and never desired to sin, you'd probably forget about God altogether. But it makes you trust and depend and look to Him. But anyway, that's for another day. Next, this new self will be bodily resurrected. Hallelujah. Paul goes on to say in verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. This old body that is holding on to that principle of sin is going to be put in a grave someday. But when Jesus returns in great power and glory, this old body is going to come out of that grave and it's not going to come out like it was put in in weakness and corruption and tainted with sin, but it's going to come out resurrected and glorified and purified after the Lord Jesus. And the old taint of sin is going to be left behind. And so... We're going to be resurrected. And it is the Spirit of God that's going to bring that resurrection about. Now let's see what Paul has said. Now let's summarize. He's talked about the old self. It's dominated by sin. It acts according to the flesh. It is in a state of spiritual death. It is hostile to God. It is rebellious and it is unable to please God. The new self is dominated by the Holy Spirit. Acts according to the Holy Spirit. Is in a state of life and peace. Is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And has eternal life and a future resurrection. Paul says, now that you see this, look in verse 12. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if we live according to the flesh, you must die. But by the Spirit, you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Paul says, look at the two. Look at what you were, and now look at what you are, and look, you're under no obligation to live as you were. So don't do it. Put to death the deeds of the old self, and you will live. And one of the main purposes, there are two purposes this morning. Go to the next slide. First, I believe God wants you to ask yourself, which one of these two characterize my life? The old self or the new self? Which one of these two dominate my life? Impurity, immorality, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, outbursts, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, or love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Which one of those 
dominate your life. If you say the old self, then you're not even saved. And my plea to you is to come to Jesus and ask Him, beg Him to save you and give you that new creation. The truth is, some of us, excuse me, the truth is, all of us see something on that left side in our life. Now don't tell me you don't because you'll be lying. And that's up there, right? Because none of us have made it all the way to the right side and we probably won't in this life. Why? Because that old sin is still hanging around. But your life should not be dominated by the old self but by the new self. Now this is the purpose I believe God wants the main thing for today. I want you to be honest and I want you to identify where the old self is influencing your life today. Where you're being influenced by immorality or sensuality or outburst of anger or jealousy or strife. Be honest about it. Because next week, Lord willing, we're going to see how to put to death these deeds of the flesh, the old self, that you might walk in obedience to God. But you've got to be honest and admit where they're in your life before you can put them to death. All right? And we're going to spend a moment with God, and I just desire His Spirit to speak to you, and just to show you where the old self is still raising his ugly head and having an influence in your life. Let's pray. We do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team, uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our minister of community connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area... Uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcomed at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.